first of all, you are all amazing, by the way. It's just so cool to see just vibrant, yeah. beautiful. Again to you guys. Amazing people. But I still took thieves, just in case anybody has any dirty, dirty germs. <laughs> and that's, that's my secret weapon. I keep a little bottle in my, in my bag, and I just do a few... So I'm, so you right keep now, a lot of bottles. If you can that. smell my breath, like it's full on clove cinnamon, knock you out. <laughs> it's good though. It's good. I did. I did have a chance to smell your breath. It smells pretty amazing. There you go. <laughs> so everybody, thank you so much for coming tonight. It's uh, incredible to have all of you here. Like Ben said, um, Ben Greenfield needs no introduction. So happy to have you. And this event. I, you know what? I I need to figure out how to smirk. Like I somehow did in that photo. <laughs> I feel like I need the sly. It took us a while to find the smirking yeah. photo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, we just want to thank all of our sponsors of this event. Of course, Orange Theories here, Warby Parker, Peloton, who am I forgetting, uh, Under Armour, and uh, us at Next Health. So uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you to our sponsors. And we're ready to start our conversation. Budweiser wouldn't come on board. <laughs> I, just I wonder why. Yeah. <laughs> So, Ben, this book yes, sir. It is, literally gave me a flashback to medical school when I was carrying around <laughs> textbooks like this thick. You guys, did you guys pick up a copy of the book yet? I mean, is it not crazy? Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's not a, like, it looks like a textbook, but I'm not smart enough to write an actual textbook. If you actually open it, it reads a lot easier than a textbook. But it, it makes me look really smart to have a <laughs> book that, that's shaped I mean, like a textbook. Arguably, Bo, there's a ton of information in there. I mean, I feel yeah. like everything that you and I have been talking about since we've met each other for years now is in that book. Like, it was a, basically a download of everything in your brain, right? Um, not everything <laughs> in my brain, but... Um, yeah, I mean, what what I wanted, and and this is probably why you know I got turned down so much trying to get the thing published is like a book I wanted to read. Like I just wanted a book that that I love, which is something I can come back to over and over again. As a matter of fact, so how many of you in there or in here have uh, bookshelves in your house, like with real paper books? So I always have like one shelf, and it's dedicated to the books that I return to every year. Right, so there's about 12 books on the, up on that shelf right now. And, it, and it's, it's really cool that like, when you really, really dig a book and you put it up in your books I want to return to every year shelf, it, it is a way for you to return to that wisdom. There's, there's an app also called Readwise. Man here uses Readwise. You sign up on this app and it, it curates all your books and then every single week it sends you an email with the most popular highlights, including your highlights and little snippets from the book. So your favorite books are always top of mind. But I wanted to write Boundless to be a book like that, that you come back to over and over again that wasn't kind of a, kind of a flash in the pan. So Right. It's and it's, what I love about it is I, had I just got the book a couple of days ago. I read a few chapters. I mean, it is so comprehensive. So you kind of follow the structure in the book where you start off with like brain health and you go through everything. Like what was your thought process around what, about the content? Well, originally it was 10 chapters on the brain, 10 chapters on the body, and 10 on the spirit. But the problem was that turned into like 1,200 pages. So I, I kind of melded a lot of the content together. So, so it's ultimately still what I wanted it to be, right? Mind, body, and spirit. Uh, but it's, it's, it's kind of all woven together into the chapters, although what I, what, what I want to do, which hopefully you see as you go through the book, is I start with the brain because I think if you don't have the motivation or the energy or the mindfulness or the clarity to be able to digest information you might find elsewhere in the book, then I don't think it serves you as well. So that's why I start off with the, with the neurotransmitters and the blood-brain barrier and some of these things that I think ultimately could optimize your, your cognitive functions so that you can get through the rest of the book for anybody who's crazy enough to actually want to read it cover to cover. Um, I, I also wrote the book to be like a, like a cookbook. So you, so you could, you know, whatever, I'm, I'm going to travel to India in a couple of weeks, right? So I would go through the immune system section and I would, I would say, okay, what can I do before I get on the flight? What can I do to make sure I'm not catching any airborne pathogens? What do I take if I get food poisoning? So that's, that's kind of what I want it to be is something that um, 
that you don't have to feel guilty about not reading the cover cover, but you can just keep wherever you keep it and, and flip to whatever chapter fits your fancy or your need at the time. Yeah, it's like a part reference book, part just great read. So I wanted to ask you some of the chapters I read. I have some specific questions for you, and I'd love to get some feedback from you on some of this stuff. So one of the things that I think a lot of the patients like we share, we talked about a couple today, sleep problems, right? I mean, this is something I talk about all the time, but you had some like pretty advanced biohacks in there for sleep, some stuff that even I just barely heard about that you've participated in and working on. So tell me a little bit about like that wristband you're wearing and some of these things that you're doing for sleep. Yeah, yeah. this is, um, actually, I'm, I'm going to release a podcast on this. I think it comes out next week because I'm always messing around with, with all this random stuff to get sent to my house and, and half of it I, I don't wind up implementing. And I've always just worn this cheap ass Timex watch and then the, the aura ring but this is um, this was developed by a guy uh, who has in the past worked like trauma and PTSD and the Maps Foundation. He wanted to try to create something that instead of requiring things like ketamine and MDMA would instead elicit a similar neural response using sound waves. So I have it on right now, and it sends sound waves up the long bone of the legs, or you could wear it on your on your wrist, and it could it sends sound waves that way, and it seems to be working. Like like right now, I just have it in. Um, uh, social in on the social setting, right? So I so because otherwise I'm just a complete bore and totally introverted. So I have to put on a wearable to actually be social because uh, they didn't have any cocktails here. But uh, but it's also got like a sleep mode. Cocktails are coming. Yeah. Oh, they are. Okay. It's got a sleep mode and a rest mode. So so yeah. I mean, it's, uh, some something like that I would consider to be very fringe icing on the cake compared to sleep hygiene, right? Beginning your circadian rhythm at the beginning of the day, which everybody forgets. You know, the first thing I did when I woke up this morning, I'm, I'm down in Santa Monica, took off my shoes, went out, walked along the beach, got the sunshine. When I'm at home, you know, I'm either doing that or I'm doing the biohacking equivalent of that, you know, standing with the, I have uh, two of those juve lights. So I put one, that I, I have a short one that I put in front of me and then the long one goes behind me. So basically at my stand-up desk, I can be standing like that and typing and then I have you know, the glasses that kind of charge you up and the, and the in-ear phototherapy. So yeah, you always start your circadian rhythm at the beginning of the day. And then I'm, I'm very cognizant, you know, everything from the glasses under the, under the bright lights to the light exposure in the evening for setting up normal sleep hygiene from a lighting standpoint. But again, it, it's also a lot of the little things, right? Like huge game changer for me are the, are the incandescent red bulbs in the bedroom. So in the bedroom and in the, in the master bathroom, so every time you flip, flip on the lights, you know, or, or, or you, you get up at night to pee, you're not blasting yourself with that blue light. And then I found this red light covering on Amazon that I put on the refrigerator light, right? So when we're cleaning up the kitchen after dinner, or if, God forbid, I decide I'm going to get up at, at, you know, 11 p.m. and go make myself some coconut milk, honey, collagen, whatever. Um, I don't get blasted with, with the circadian rhythm. So that's another one. And uh, in addition to light, most of you are aware of normal sleep hygiene. The other two are what? In addition to light, if you could name two others. Yeah, yeah, temperature, exactly. The temperature, I think somebody else said noise. It's the temperature and the, and the silence. And so the temperature is, is, a, is a big one. So when I travel, it's, it's hard because I don't have the chili pad. And, and sometimes I don't have say over how low the engineer at the hotel has allowed the cooling system to go. So when you travel, though, there are little hacks, too. Like I always do a hot, cold contrast shower before bed. So it's 20 seconds of cold and 10 seconds of hot. That gets me nice and cool before bed. And then I also wear socks to bed because when you wear socks to bed, and there's a fascinating study on sleep latency and wearing socks, it actually vasodilates and allows the rest of the body to cool. But sometimes it's more than just you know taking off all your clothes. It, it, you know, there's a lot of other little things that go into the cooling component. But that's huge. And I mean, I've, I've quantified that. And that's one of the best things, especially for deep sleep, is the cold. And then the silence piece. You know, and now it's it's not just in the bedroom on airplanes, um, any situation where I want to be more parasympathetically driven. The more I can block out that 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 noise with the foam ear plugs, and then typically either the side sleeping headphones, the sleep phones, or I'll sometimes wear the Bose noise blocking headphones if I'm sleeping on my back using the uh, using the neck nest pillow. 
and that allows me to just block everything out. Now, I think, and I, I was thinking about this the other day, I think there's a fourth, and I think the fourth is safety, safety. Like, like it, it's so how many of you sleep way better at home than you do in a hotel room or whatever, the back of a taxi or an airplane? Part of that is we're just slightly on guard. We're out of our element. There's a little bit of sympathetic nervous system activation, and that's where I think there, there's some other things that you can do. I mean, like, on a plane, I figured out that if I pull on a hoodie and I pull the hoodie over my head and I've got the, the mindfold sleep blocking mask and the headphones, I can just block almost everything out, like total sensory Depth. Another example would be a gravity blanket. A gravity blanket. I have a 25 pound gravity blanket, too heavy to travel with, but I have that at home and I pull it over myself and it just elicits this like parasympathetic feeling of safety. And so I think the more that you can convince your body that it's safe, I think that's also really, really important when it comes to sleep. And, and that even includes your bedroom, right? Like work is not something your body associates with safety, right? That, that's more sympathetic focus, active activity. So I never, even when I'm at a hotel, even if it's a small hotel room, I don't lay on the bed with a laptop, right? Like I have that rule, like my laptop can't touch the bed. And that's because I associate it with work and I don't want the bed to be associated with work. So I think safety is underemphasized with sleep hygiene, but I think that's another big one. Yeah, that was all great tips. And I love it how you say that, you know, it really starts in the morning. I tell all my patients that your sleep routine starts as soon as you wake up by going outside and, you know, exposing yourself to the sun and the elements and grounding. All those things are so correct. And uh, I kind of chuckled when you said the uh, safety element and the heavy blanket. My wife who's here, she's like, why the hell do we have this 30-pound blanket on, be on the bed? Yeah. <laughs> like, my, my Trust wife me, goes, it works. <laughs> my wife goes back and forth on a ton of this shit. Yeah. Like, she, like, she has a chili pad on her side. She never turns it on. And the, the, the gravity blanket, she doesn't like it a lot because she can't, like, squeeze in and snuggle with me as much. But, but she loves the infrared lights because our bedroom's like a, like a nightclub. You know? <laughs> so so they, they double as a sex hack, too, those red lights. Because, like, but, like you, your, your lover looks amazing under the red light, and usually they think you do, too. It just makes you look better, the red light. So, so there's a bonus. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So just remembering some time I spent with you and your wife, we ate at a uh, restaurant called Saddle Peak. Yeah. We had a lot of great, great meat. And we were talking about the carnivore diet. And I love your book because, you know, like, there's not one diet that everyone can do, right? We all know that. But I love how you talk about personalizing your diet and you give people hints on how to do that. And can you talk a little bit about that? Just give, like, a quick kind of overview well, yeah. of that? Uh, I, I mean... You go and you read a book like Roger Williams' Biochemical uh, Individuality, which, which you know, was way back in the day. I think that book was written in like the 60s, and it's fascinating because he's got you know, 12 different shapes of, of the liver and different sizes of the stomach that vary from human being to human being, but it's not just the shape of the anatomical structures. There are highly variable uh, rates of vitamin D excretion in many people, meaning like if you take a vitamin D supplement and you're not quantifying, you might be getting arterial calcification from vitamin D. Um, same thing can go for oxalate and uric acid excretion. Same thing can go for your, your ability or non-ability to harness vitamin D from sunlight uh, based on your, your FTO gene, your predisposition to weight gain in response to saturated fat or you know, the, the ketogenic diet craze, you know, you might have familial hypercholesteremia or you might have poor gallbladder or, or liver bile function that might limit your ability to do well with that. And this dictates that like, it, it, you just can't pick up a popular diet book and follow it and assume because it worked for everybody, it's going to work for you, right? Like, if you're, if you're an under-methylator and you have poor availability of methyl groups and you're eating a plant-based diet, but you're not getting the methionine and the methyl groups from meat, that might not be the best diet for you. But the cool thing is we live in this era now where self-quantification that would have only been something in the hands of the rich and the wealthy 10 years ago, you know, people participating in executive longevity programs, we can now do things like a $97 genetic test and a micronutrient panel and a, a Genova, you know, a gut panel and a Cyrex food allergy panel. And there's like the, these, these five or six different tests that you can get. And that's what, if, for those of you who have the book, once you get to the diet section, all I did was find out, okay, what are the blood markers, gene markers, urine markers, lifestyle markers, activity goals, the things that would allow you to choose any one of these 
popular diets and decide whether or not it's going to work for you. And then I just work with most of the diets I use with my clients, right? Like everything from a Walls protocol to uh, like a plant paradox, more low lectin diet to an autoimmune diet, um, ancestral diet, carnivore diet. So, I, so what I wanted to do was just basically give you like 12 to 13 different diets and that's enough to where, you know, once you get past that, most of the diets start to look pretty similar. And then teach you how to choose which diet is right for you, because that's so important. And it changes, right? Like, if you're a candidate for the paleo autoimmune diet because you have leaky gut and autoimmune sensitivity issues, that's not what you're stuck on for life, right? Same thing with a carnivore diet. I think it's wonderful for healing the gut, but I'm not going to eat sheep testicles and kidney suet, you know, for the rest of my life when I want to have grandma's wonderful casserole at Thanksgiving dinner and my wife makes a, you know, kale, beet, goat cheese salad, I'm not going to say, well, that's poor man's food or survival food, even though it technically is. And yeah, you can get everything you need from meat. Um, I, I think that a lot of these diets are things you do short term to heal the body before you progress into a more expansive diet with probably what I think is the best example of that, that most of, most of my clients, like once they're healthy, once the gut is fixed, they're feeling good. Most of them are on kind of like a Weston A. Price type of diet, right? Like soaked, sprouted, fermented grains and legumes, good wild-caught, organic, grass-fed, grass-finished meat, eggs, a uh, heavy amount of fermented foods, raw dairy, fermented dairy. And I, I think of all the diets, like if, once you're healthy, that's, that, that, it, it's pretty dang ancestral yeah. and, and tasty and easy to follow. Right, right. And I love how you bring it all to the science of it and testing biomarkers and tying it back to the biomarkers to individualize what an individual needs. And that's what we do in Next Health. We do the biomarker panel first and then we do a, a diet recommendation because doing it the other way, it just takes you forever to figure it out. And you, you end up finding out things later than you should when, um, without having the biomarker data. So it's definitely the way to go. Yeah. And I think, you know, if your doctor's not doing that for you, which most doctors aren't gonna do it for you, you can seek out like a place like Next Health or Ben's, ben, all of this information is in Ben's book and he goes through one, one biomarker at a time and tells you what to look for, which is what I, I love yeah. that. Yeah, but I mean, I tell you what, cause, cause it, I mean, even that can get expensive. Like if you do like, you know, the five or six tests, you're still, you know, if you're paying out of pocket for some of this stuff, still pushing, you know, north of a thousand dollars. But I mean, the, the heart rate variability metric, just, just for real time quantification of how food agrees with your body. I would, I would honestly say that or continuous blood glucose monitor. Cause even for me, when I wore a Dexcom last year, I found out weird things. Like, like when my blood sugar kept snaking way high, when I'd have green beans, right? A slow release legume. So I got a Cyrex panel and I asked actually have a true autoimmune reaction to that food. So a glucose monitor or, a, or an HRV analysis, meaning if your HRV is dropping in a postprandial state, when it should be rising, because you should be parasympathetically driven in a postprandial state, that can be a sign that whatever diet you're eating or whatever meal that was might not have been the best one for you. So even if you're not going to get in blood, saliva, and urine, even just like HRV and blood glucose can, can give you a decent real-time running analysis. Right. And if... You know, if you don't have access to a CGM, we can prescribe one for you. That your sometimes insurance will cover it, which is great, and it's amazing data. You don't have to wear it all the time; you just wear it for three months. And I wore mine for three months, and I found out everything I needed to know as far as what foods caused the glucose spike and what didn't, and it really helped to yeah. control my insulin levels. And you, and you know what what plummeted when I wore that thing for a year, what plummeted blood glucose more than anything else and kept it stable nearly the entire day, like all the way through dinner. You know what it was? Cold in the morning, doing the cold shower or the cold soak in the morning, vast difference in blood glucose response the entire rest of the day. So, I mean, to me, like having a free hack like that, like, you know, I have to take metformin or, or like any fancy supplements, you know, not that those things aren't useful, you know, to, to you know, put you in an insulin sensitive state or help after a, a pasta feed or something like that. But man, the, the cold, it was the biggest thing for me. 
right. Yeah, and then and then another another one that surprised me was how high it spikes after a cup of coffee. Ah. After a cup of coffee without sugar or calories or anything in it, the blood glucose still goes up because you get that cortisol release. So you get ah. glycogenolysis. Your liver starts to break down glycogen, and that's it's kind of good. That's what you want coffee to do. You wake you up and get you a little bit of cortisol, and that's it's not necessarily a bad thing because it's not exogenous glucose, right? It's very transient, very short term rise in blood glucose, and it's coming from your own stores, so you're burning whatever's in your body anyways. But that was interesting, too, was how, how high the blood glucose spikes after coffee. What worked for me was apple cider vinegar. Just doing a little bit of apple cider vinegar before yes. meals really control my glucose response. And, yeah. You know, I read the studies, I and mean, the studies show this to be true, but yeah. I was like, come on, it can't really oh, work. A- apple cider works. vinegar, and, and you can make a cocktail with apple cider vinegar. Oh. And Oh, here, here, here's one for you. This isn't in the book, because I just discovered this, and I don't think you can get it anywhere yet, but I bet... I bet it will become popular. Um, 1,3-butane diol. It's like a form of a ketone ester that gives you the same buzz as alcohol, but it doesn't form acetaldehyde, so it's not an actual neural toxin. And I've been experimenting with that for two weeks because I usually have a glass of organic wine or I make myself like a little you know, gin bitters cocktail when we're having our family dinners. And I started to do some of this, uh, this butane dial with lime and tonic water. And I get the same buzz as alcohol and, and none, of the, none of the toxic side effects. So yeah, I, I think one of the next big things in wellness is gonna be like healthy cocktails that give you a good buzz and make you feel amazing. But don't, not that I have much against alcohol. I think microdoses of ethanol are actually, they, I think they induce a good mild hormetic stress. I think that's one of the reasons, like people in the blue zones, a lot of them will, will have one or two drinks a day. I think there's, there's a hormetic stressor from that poison. But like at the, at the book launch party in, in New York City, it was really cool because we had 12 different cocktails on the menu, but they were all like adaptogens and chaga and reishi and all these amazing feel good compounds that didn't actually involve alcohol. So I think that's going to, and there's some companies commercializing that. Like I think Kin is one that, that, that I'm familiar with. But I just think it's really cool how we don't have to just like, you know, have a margarita or a mojito at night. And, and I think that's going to be, mark my words, like one, one, of, the, one of the up and comers in, in the whole wellness industry. Where do you get that from? Uh, I got it from, uh, from a guy who, I, th- I think it, it was made in uh, Frank Veach's lab, okay. a ketone researcher. And it, it's, it's not commercially available or anything. I'm just throwing that out there. But I, but I think like even the use of, of variants of, of ketones for, as an alcohol alternative. You got to get that on Kion, Kion, yeah, on the website. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so flipping through the book, I noticed that uh, there was at least three times where you mentioned you were naked. You spend a lot of time naked. <laughs> right, yeah, but but that's that's not like a that that's not like a marketing ploy. Like literally, I know. when I was a kid, my if you talk to my mom and dad, I they would put a diaper on me, and every single morning the diaper would be flung across the room. Sometimes with with excrement on the walls and you know every, everything, else. I would not keep my clothes on ever. I ran around the house. Nate, my parents got to the point where they would put eight baby diaper pins in the diaper to keep me leaving my diaper on <laughs> at night. And when you come up to our house, like USPS, you know, FedEx, UPS, they all, like my boys and I, we just, sometimes we don't put any clothes on until like noon. Like yeah. we're, we're very, very kind of free at the Greenfield <laughs> house. My wife, God bless her. Like she, she somehow stays sane. But um, yeah, we just like, we like to be free. We like yeah. loosey goosey pajama pants. And, That's awesome. I mean, yeah. there's something super spiritually liberating about that. And you talk a lot about having kind of a liberated spirit and having a spirit where you're feeling connected to nature, to God. Like that's a big part of your life, right? Oh, it's 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 not a bit. It's it's the biggest, the biggest part of my life. Like there's just something about living life and being full of hope and being able to speak to a higher power and being able to to engage in what I think is one of the underemphasized parts of a lot of these blue zones and longevity hotspots, and that would be the spiritual disciplines, right? Just as important as the physical disciplines, you know, the the Turkish get-ups and the kettlebell swings and the things we do to get fitter and the, the end back and the mind games and maybe playing musical instruments to get smarter. Well, I mean, the, the most important part of us, and, and what I think is the one part of us that's going to go on to live forever, you know, that spark your soul. So many of us have that part just, just 
shriveled up and shrunken inside of us because we don't care for it. And, and, and when you look at things like fasting and, 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 and fellowship with other people and positive relationships and living with a spirit of love towards other and having some kind of charity or service in your local community and a gratitude practice and those times of the year when you go off into silence and solitude and, and your own little getaway, I, I think that, that when you build your spiritual armor in that way, it's one of the, one of the best things you can do for your happiness and for your, for your purpose and for your fulfillment in life. And, you know, I've said this recently on a podcast, you know, the 109 or however old she is, you know, like John Claremont, I, I think she recently passed away, but there are others, or John Calment. And, you know, these are like gin chugging cigarette smoking, you know, folks who are living well past the age they should be living past since they don't have cryotherapy chambers and NAD IVs and, and infrared saunas, but they've got strong love and relationships and a robust social life and a belief in a higher power and they've gotten the journaling and, and I think that's a huge, huge part of this. And for me, um, I would say it's the past two years that the light bulb's really, really gone on. When, like, I'm literally, you know, sitting cross-legged in my hotel room now for 20 minutes before I even think about hitting the gym or, or any of those things that I would have done right when I got up. And, and our whole family is gratitude journaling together in the morning, and I'm taking my kids through a meditation and a prayer. And at night, we revisit the gratitude journals, and we all talked about who he helps that day. And it's just this magical, magical way to live. And, and I, think, I think more important than any chapter on fat loss or muscle gain or biohacking the brain or anything anything like that, I think that's the most important. That's the biggest thing. Yeah. See, I'm so glad we talked about that because one of my favorite things about you is you're not just a biohacker. You're not just an elite athlete, but you're such a well-rounded person. And all of this that you're talking about is all in the book, guys. So, you know, you, you, we're not just talking about, he's not just talking about biohacking in the book and blood tests. He's talking about how to become a deeper, spiritually more connected person with the world and everyone around you. And, uh, and it, it just totally is your personality. Um, another thing that I love about you is how much you love your kids and all the things you do with your kids. And, you know, it's too much to get into right now, but, you know, I have kids and um, I follow your example. And so I'd love for you to talk about like two or three things that you're doing with your kids right now to kind of have them follow in your footstep of mental, spiritual, and well being. Well, number one, I already mentioned, like like having your children join with you, and we carve out that time. We carve out that time, meaning that the night before we all decide what time we're going to meet as a family, everybody's just there in the living room, and they're waiting, and we gather together, and we talk about what we're going to do that day, and everybody opens their gratitude journals and shares what they're grateful for, and, and we do a meditation, and I lead them, and, and at least once a week, I get to teach my kids a new form of breath work or a new way to meditate, you know, whether it's mindfulness or whether it's a centering prayer or something that they can learn each week. So they're just building each week as we go. And that, that's, that's one of the coolest things is, you know, for us originally it was the family dinners and having these wonderful, long family dinners playing. You know, the other night it was Monopoly. That's when I made it through three of those ketone cocktails because that's a long-ass <laughs> game. And, uh, you know, we, we play like all the, all the games from the oatmeal.com, like Exploding Kittens and Unstable Unicorns and Bear versus babies, and, and we have these wonderful family dinners, just laughing and playing for, for a good, good hour for dinner, but then that morning practice. And then the two other things that are probably the biggest things for us uh, from a, from a child-rearing standpoint is, A, we, we kind of parent based on this, uh, I think it's called a love and logic uh, philosophy, and this is based on the idea that you don't tell your kids no, you don't slap their hands away from things, you don't set up forbidden fruits like, no, you can't taste that wine, you're not allowed to touch alcohol until you're, uh, until you're 18, or, or don't eat gluten, ever. I don't care what everybody else is doing at the birthday party, don't touch it. Or, or um, uh, we, we don't use screens at night or, or um, never let me find you looking at a porn website. Like none of that. There's, there's no rules. Instead, we educate our children about the consequences of their decisions, then let them go on to make that decision. Sure, if they're a baby walking towards a hot stove, you know, you, you want to keep them away. There are some exceptions to rules that children might not be able to understand. But when we get our, our shipment of wine to the house, you know, I pour a little into the shot glass and I go through, through the origin and the, and the grape and how 
it was grown and the kids get to taste and mom and I taste and we share the notes. And, you know, my first experience was with alcohol was stealing a, a, a bottle of scotch from my dad's office and getting drunk in my bedroom when I was 14 because alcohol was just like this off-limits strange thing that we weren't allowed to go near and it sets up this forbidden fruit. You know, and, and we teach them what gluten does and, and the neural inflammation. And even if you don't have a, a, an allergy to it, how it can affect the body in other ways and the glyphosate that's often accompanied with the gluten. And then we tell them, you know, you want to go to the birthday party? Sure. Like, have as many cupcakes or as much peach as you want. Here's a bottle of, of you know, gluten digesting enzyme, you know, and then they, they take that with them. But but they make a decision. Sometimes they'll have a quarter of a cupcake and 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 they'll they'll come home and punish some coconut ice cream or something later on. But but they're making the decisions for themselves. We empower them. And, you know, they're 11 now and they're 12 or 13. I'll be, you know, taking them through yourbrainonporn.com and telling them, you go, you know, hang out on porn websites all you want, but here's what it does to dopamine. Here's what it does to your view of the opposite sex. Here's what it does to objectifying women. And, and so they'll learn that and then they'll be free to go on and make their own decisions. So that, that's the second thing. And then the last thing, just very quickly, is... We, I gave them the option last year to not go to school, and I told them that I was willing to, if they didn't want to go to school, all they needed to do was share with me all their dreams, all their passions, all their interests, all their desires, and what I would do is find a way for them to pursue that and surround them with the activities and the tutors and the local community classes and the places they can go and the things they could see and the areas they could travel to, and that's that it, it's not homeschooling, which is more formally gathering around curriculum at the kitchen table with mom and dad. This is instead just life experience-based education. It's called unschooling. Probably the best book I read that really helped me wrap my head around the logistics of it was a book called Unschooling to University, which is a pretty good uh, recently written, so it's a relevant book on the topic. But this idea now of life-based education, and, and I think when you when you combine that with the, with the set-up family time, throughout the day and the building of the spiritual disciplines, when you combine that with the with this love to logic type of parenting approach or education approach, and then you use that that unschooling type of mentality and life based experiences, I, I you know my, my kids are only eleven, right? Like I, I can only say so much about how it's done. You know, maybe I can tell you more when they're eighteen, whether they're in prison or they're curing cancer, one of the two. But I, I, it, it just works. It seems it seems to work really well. So that's my philosophy. That's awesome. Fantastic. So last question. I'm going to take some audience questions. So. I'm always jealous when I see like pictures of your house and stuff you're doing up in Spokane. It's just such a beautiful setting. Looks like it's like super clean and gorgeous out there. But we live in LA and we are constantly surrounded by EMFs and toxins in our water and our food. And like, what can we do other than becoming a nut like Luke's story and build an entire house around this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. The yeah. two. It's to fight this, you know? Like it's a constant it, it, struggle. Well, it, it's an evolutionary mismatch, right? That, that's a term I've thrown around before, this idea that we are faced, and especially in the past hundred years, by things that human beings for thousands of years from a genetic standpoint uh, have not had to deal with. And, and perhaps in a thousand years, we will have developed some kind of, you know, genetic response to non-native EMF to where our cell membranes might become more impervious to, to 5G or something like that. But right now, what we're facing is... Uh, a complete universe of evolutionary mismatches. And you can't do a lot about it when you're out and about, aside from undo the damage when you're home. For example, we know that, that flying on an airplane, airline radiation, uh, x-ray machines, um, you know, toxins in the air, et cetera, the, the primary thing that you get with all the non-native EMF as you're on airports and traveling is you get a uh, calcium channel uh, or, or calcium influx into the cell, like in, into the cell membrane. So you're setting up a positive ionic environment inside the cell when it's supposed to be a negative ionic environment. You get uh, DNA and protein damage. And uh, you get an, uh, a, a down regulation, what's called the NF kappa B pathway, which modulates inflammation. Well, the, you know, this is just one example. I mean, we could talk for hours about this, but I'm just going to give you one example. So, what do you do after you fly? Well, how how can you offset the calcium channel influx into the cell? You take magnesium, right? So, so, so that's part of your your travel kit. Is you use magnesium after you've traveled and, and heftily when you're doing airline travel. Uh, how can you stop the DNA damage? Well, the two things that repair DNA 
DNA are NAD and sirtuins. NAD and sirtuins. So you get your hands on like a sirtuin rich compound like, like a resveratrol or a terostilbene or, or even like some, you know, cacao or beet or, or any of these other sirtuin rich foods and you take an NAD supplement or, or NMN or NR to combat the DNA damage. How do you upregulate the NF kappa B pathway? Through fasting and ketosis, right? So you, so you fast a little bit when you're traveling or at least you're going to snack. You snack on macadamia nuts or something that's a more ketone friendly food. And, and so once you begin to systematically identify the evolutionary mismatches and then systematically identify, okay, what can I do to undo the damages of this? Then you can just start to set up your life so that even though you might not be able to escape it while you're in an airport or on an airplane or in your office or at a mall, you can at least take little steps to, to, to address what you're doing. Like if I, if I didn't have blue light blocking glasses on tonight and I was under these bright lights, well, I know that even though I don't need to take melatonin every night to sleep, I'm in a situation right now where melatonin is going to be suppressed later on. So maybe tonight would be a night where I'd take melatonin because I'm in a, an environment I normally wouldn't be on at night. I'm not under the incandescent red lights. I've got these fluorescent lights on. So, and the mall would not replace all their lights with incandescent. I don't know. <laughs> Why? Um, so yeah, it, it's, just a, it's just a matter of identifying evolutionary mismatches than being smart about the way you battle them. Love it, awesome. So we have some time, 15 minutes or so, for audience questions. Who has a question? Go for it. Um, I was wondering if uh, there's any biohacks to help me uh, heal a navicular uh, stress fracture on my foot and what I could do in training to keep developing uh, running endurance through this injury. Yeah, the, the, uh, the bone healing thing, you asked about a biohack for that. Probably the best one for bone healing is PEMF. There's good data behind that for, for bone healing, for mobilization of stem cells. I mean, that's, it's, it's handy for a lot of things. It's kind of like a shotgun for a lot of things. But, but for healing up a broken bone faster, PEMF works really well, like a flex pulse or an earth pulse or, a, uh, or, a, or one of the, the pulse centers units or anything like that. Like, that's really good. And then, um, you know, as, as, as far as the, the running goes, if it's in your feet, you know, a lot of people are big on the minimalist footwear thing. But if you're going to go minimalist, like, you got to get, you got to get shoes with a good foot plate. Like the, um, uh, it's not Vivo Barefoot. Uh, um, uh, their, their shoe is called, uh, I'm, I'm blanking on it, and I was racing on it in, in Spartans all last year. It starts with an A. Uh, Ultra, yeah, the Ultra. They have a shoe like the Ultra that's minimalist, but has, has a good foot plate in it. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot more you could do, but, but yeah. I'd there's a peptide called BPC-157 that you could also try. So that's another thing. Yeah. And Keon Flex, of course. Yeah. That stuff's amazing. Hi, I'm a bartender, and I just want to know, I've gotten into um, like sleep biohacking. Is there anything I can do two, three nights a week? I'm usually going to sleep at three, four in the morning. Uh, is there anything I can do to kind of help with that circadian rhythm thing that I'm, I know I'm messing up? Yeah, um, the, pro probably the best thing would be to, and this is in the book, like go to the section on napping and just train yourself how to become a napping superstar. So, I mean, for, for me, with as much as I travel, I live and die by, like, 20 to 45-minute power naps and usually involves some kind of vagal nerve stimulation. Like, I'll use, like, the Circadia Fisher-Wallace or the, the New Calm device is my favorite right now. Some kind of relaxing compound that doesn't leave you drowsy after the nap. And my favorite top of the totem pole for that is Reishi Mushroom. So I do a couple packets of the Four Sigmatic. Same thing I was talking about with sleep and safety noise-blocking headphones, something like the Mindfold sleep mask, mm -hmm. and then really good beats that you're playing like Brain FM or New Calm through the headphones, uh, something like a gravity blanket or something that gives you that intense feeling of safety. And then usually I'll use uh, like a 4-8 breathwork protocol to breathe myself into that napping state. And there's, there's some interesting data coming out of like the, the guys at New Calm right now are showing that like that 20 minute cycle can simulate close to what a 90 minute sleep cycle does for you. Mm. And if you, if you 
didn't, because that's expensive advice, like $5,000. But the other thing that does, does something similar is Yoga Nidra, right? So if you can go to YouTube and download some of like the 30 or 60 minute Yoga Nidra tracks. And so you got a few on your phone and you can say, okay, I got 30 minutes right now. I'm going to do this full body awareness, full body scan. And they've done some brain scans of folks doing Yoga Nidra. And it, it helps to simulate that sleep cycle for winding down as well. Hi, I have a question for both of you. Um, success comes with obstacles and challenges. What do either of you do or both of you do to keep yourself mentally strong as opposition and challenges come when you're wanting to um, forge a new pathway or just, just push forward in your life to that new plateau? Do you want me to go first, Doc? All right. Um. All you. <laughs> Um, daily, I, I pray and I meditate every day. I mean, that, that's the number one way that, that I stay sane with, you know, all the bullets that are flying out of the computer's email inbox and the freaking matrix that I wake to every morning. And, and I would, I would put breath work right in there as well. And then I also have those times where I have some pretty intense periods of silence and solitude. On a quarterly basis, I have three to four days carved out. And it's typically either complete alone time, unplugged from work in the wilderness or at home or in the forest, but, but without any consults or calls scheduled, or else it's a plant medicine ceremony, which, which I highly respect and I think is often overdone and, and overemphasized and kind of bastardized a little bit. But, you know, I'll do either quarterly plant medicine or some kind of quarterly retreat where I'm just able to go into a deep state of introspection, much deeper than I'd be able to do in the middle of the day, you know, during a 20-minute meditation session, and then daily prayer, meditation, and breath work. Yeah, it's all great stuff. For me, you know, this has been a constant struggle in my life. I run two companies and, you know, kids at home. It's just nuts all the time. And for me, what I figured out like a, a long time ago, probably like eight years ago, was stress is actually not a bad thing if you know how to manage it. And the way to manage stress is to break it up. No matter, you can't have constant stress because constant stress causes constant inflammation. So I make it a definite like requirement that if I'm doing some activity at work that I have a timer and I set that timer to 40 minutes and after 40 minutes I take a 10 minute break every single time and then every week there has to be one day of self-care every month there has to be a weekend of just like being alone or being with the family and then every quarter there's like a week off so if I follow that routine I find that I can handle the stress really well and then the other two things I do is Number one is journaling is very important for me. Um, I find like life goes by way too fast and sometimes you just can't remember how amazing your life is. And I keep a journal every single day. I use an app called Day One. And every day I look at it and it reminds me of this day last year, this day five years ago. And I see that I've had this full, amazing life. And the last thing I do is I always try to stay optimistic. I think once you lose your optimism and your just your drive to wake up every morning and make a difference in the world, then life just gets horrible. And so I just stay optimistic and I look at all the positive things around me. I have a gratitude journal. It's called the five minute journal. If you're looking for a great way to stay, uh, to stay in a state of gratitude, the five minute journal is a great way to, to start off. We have our kids doing the five minute journal every day and they, they yeah. love it. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and the gratitude, I mean, that it's, it's so important. That's, that's part of, of kind of like the meditation and prayer practice is the gratitude piece. And um, there, there was something I was going to comment on. Oh, it's, it's, it's related to what, what you said about optimism. And this, this is a, a big one that you'll find in, in you know, the writings of folks like, you know, Anthony DeMello and, and Eckhart Tolle and... and just this whole concept that really nobody has the power over whether or not you're going to be happy except you. Like you can choose to be happy no matter what circumstance that you're in. You can choose to find the bright lining or the silver lining no matter how dark the cloud is. And you can choose to be grateful for some tiny moment of the most horrible experience. You know, whether it's that you're, you're sitting at the very, very back of the plane, tucked into the corner, right next to the bathrooms, but 
oh my gosh, you have this amazing Sky Mall magazine in front of you, and it's got so many good, aren't humans cool, and they can invent all this cool shit, like, you can just find the tiniest thing to be grateful for, and if, if you can do that in any circumstance, and almost just become a ninja, at no matter how crappy a circumstance you're in, finding one little thing to be grateful for, it does make a big difference. So, in, um, when you were doing the intermittent fasting thing, there was the whole thing of like, if you're a female, you know, maybe only 12 hour feeding, you know, fasting time or to 16 hours because, you know, it can interfere with your fertility situation. However, I was wondering if you're done with all your fertility stuff, does that still apply? Can you then do like, you know, 18 hour fast and you're kind of like in the dude land where you can kind of, um, yeah. Do what you want to do. Intermittent fasting for postmenopausal women is actually really good. It's really good. Cool. And, um, and, and kind of the opposite is the case if you're trying to be fertile or you're trying to maintain normal endocrine function. So, yeah, if you're, if you're postmenopausal, it, it's actually a, a longevity-enhancing tactic that definitely fits in. Thanks. And if, the other thing about intermittent fasting is if you have any, hy any hypoglycemia or if you're you know, on any medications that treat your glucose levels, you should definitely talk to your doctor before you do it, of course. Just make sure you're not setting yourself up for hypoglycemic attacks. Right. Thank you. What's going on, you guys? So most of us know you as like an athlete and a biohacker and really into like the science and stuff. Um, however, I've heard rumors of a, a country music EP, and I was wondering if we could get like a release date on that. Or... <laughs> oh, I got a little country music set that I think is going to come out in the next month or so uh, with Dr. Matt Cook. He and I have been making a little music, and I've got a little songbook that I travel with, with three originals that I've written so far. And... Um, yeah, I, I, my goal is to to cut an album by the time I'm 40, even if it's just in a little recording studio at the house or whatever. So yeah, I'm working on it. How do you find time to do all this stuff? I don't know. Yeah, what about the other books? You're writing other books too, right? What's that? What's your other, tell us about the other books you're writing. You have more yeah. books coming? Oh well, yeah, I'm I'm working on a on a fiction series right now. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't Was written I not about, to talk about I haven't written in about a month and a half just because the boundless launch kind of derailed some of my other writing. But, but yeah, I, I also plan to finish my my five part fiction series by the time I'm fifty. I want to have that done. So, yeah. So sorry, we don't have any more time for any more questions. I just want to thank all of you for coming. I hope you got a lot out of this. I feel like we all got to know you a little bit better, Ben, and thank you for everything you've done for everyone in the planet. Oh, well, thank you, and thank you guys. I mean, you guys, like, uh, I, don't, I don't know when they're shutting down this area, but, I mean, like, stick around. You got a bunch of kindred spirits around. Meet some people. Uh, make some plans. Go out to dinner. Have a cocktail with somebody tonight. Uh, you're, you're here. You got some cool people you can meet, and, uh, you know, I know some, some of us, like me, I'm super introverted. I'm I'm hard in social situations, but I mean, just uh, just as you stand up and you get ready to rumble, see if you can find one person you haven't met before. Shake their hand. Introduce yourself. The keto cocktails that I'm aware of are not here, but there I'm sure you can find a cocktail in this mall somewhere. But yeah, uh, get to know each other a little bit. Every everybody here, I th I think, is kind of operating on the same wavelengths and. Thank you so much for coming. I, I got to say one last thing. Sometimes I feel bad at events like this because so many people come out and I can't just spend time with, with each and every one of you because I know it would be amazing to have like a deep dive discussion with everybody here. And um, I, like, I sometimes feel bad at these things because I can't talk to everybody and, and have the amazing conversations I want to have. But um, I am just so grateful and so blessed that you all came out, and the, the, this message of boundless energy and this message of not just body optimization, not just brain optimization, but full body, mind, and spirit optimization is something that you're empowered to share. You can touch lives. Like, I honestly just... just I, I never have any clue how much of a difference I'm making until, you know, so many of you come up to me at an event like this and just shake my hand and tell me some little way that I that I helped you. And um, 
and it just means so much, but I want to tell you that every single one of you can do the same thing. You can do the same thing. You have so many lives that you can touch, so thank you so much for, for caring about that, for caring about yourself, and for coming out tonight.